Good evening, and welcome to Unlock the Door Radio. Here, I'm your host, Michael Cross, and I can assure you that you are in for a very interesting and informative hour. Tonight, we have, as a guest, Emmy. Now, that's not her real name, but she would like to remain anonymous. And the thing that, does, that makes Emmy unique is that, well... She says she's a psychopath. And, you know, we talk about psychopaths in the past on the show and so forth. And I've mentioned to the radio audience that uh, my book series, Freedom from Conscience, has as its uh, main character a young female who finds that this is an advantage for her not to have these emotions that sometimes hold us back. Um, but I, I think it'd be interesting to actually, well, have someone tell us more about what it's like to have these feelings and maybe some of the advantages. So anyway, well, Emmy, thank you for coming on this evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, can we just begin with uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself? Just, just as a, a, an intro and then we'll go into more depth. Yeah, no problem. Well, uh, first, you said that I consider myself a sociopath, and I am actually usually very careful to distinguish that I have been diagnosed as a sociopath. I don't know if I would consider myself a sociopath or not. I, I sort of don't even know if I necessarily believe that there is a disorder called sociopath, that maybe it's just a personality trait or people are just being... Uh, you know, particularly Machiavellian about the way that they interact with people. I I think that there is something going on with sociopathy, and that's why I wrote the book. It's an exploration of what does it mean to be a sociopath? Does this term apply to me? And if so, what are the implications or ramifications of that? But, uh, yeah, so the book is about that. It's also about my life. I am... A relatively normal person. You you wouldn't expect me to be a sociopath if you just met me in real life. I am in my 30s. I am an American. I am in the legal profession. I have been relatively successful. I've never been to prison. I guess those are the broad strokes. Okay. Um, could you tell us a little bit of the difference then um, between the idea of a psychopath and a sociopath? Right. So a lot of the differences are in ter terminology. So Hervey Cleckley, who wrote The Mask of Sanity, uses sociopath. He's sort of considered the father of the modern concept of sociopathy. And uh, another big player, Robert Hare, Dr. Robert Hare, who has the, the major diagnostic tool, the psychopath he checklist revised, he says psychopath, right? And the DSM... In the U.S., the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders uses the term antisocial personality disorder. So we have three basic terms that people are using. Sometimes they use them interchangeably or they think this is all referring to the same concept. Sometimes they distinguish, they make a distinction and say a sociopath is this and a psychopath is something else. And usually when they make those distinctions, a sociopath would refer to somebody who is not genetically this way. It's more an environmental issue. Uh, and a psychopath is somebody who's more born this way and then has those genes possibly triggered by environmental uh, issues. Antisocial personality disorder really focuses on the antisocial behavior. It's, it's really focused particularly on criminal behavior and is used frequently to... Uh, assess criminals in terms of whether to grant or deny them parole. So they're they're all kind of used differently. Okay, so it sounds like to a certain degree, a psychopath is more of a personality. A sociopath seems to imply a certain behavior. Mm, some people use the terms that way. I don't. I don't make any distinction between sociopath and psychopath. Some people go further and say, you know, you're a primary or secondary psychopath or you're, you're specific types of psychopaths. And I just think, you know, we know so little about this disorder or this personality type that for us to try to make these fine distinctions, you know, seems a little bit uh, cart before the horse. You know, I, I don't know if we have the data to really back up and be able to prove that these distinctions exist. Okay. Um, now, you say you've never been to jail. What is your profession? 
I'm in the legal profession. Okay. I'm sure some of the audience is going, okay, I can see that. But, uh, but, but no, seriously, the, the thing is that um, I think a lot of people have this Hollywood image of whether it's a psychopath or a sociopath of someone who's wiping blood off of a knife because they've just committed a murder or something. Whereas, would you challenge that would, in, in reference to does it come along with these kinds of uh, things that go against society? I would say, yeah, I would definitely challenge it. I think the Hollywood uh, portrayal, are there psychopaths who are like that? Probably. But I think that we can we can sort of list them. There are only so many that it's possible to write all of them down, and we, we kind of know all of them. Uh, who they are, they've been caught, you know, people that murder a lot tend to get caught. And, you know, most murderers are not sociopaths. Most sociopaths are not murderers. So there's this whole uh, other aspect of sociopaths that people just uh, don't naturally think about. Okay. We'll get into some of that in more detail in a moment. Um, do you believe you were born different? I believe that... I have always felt different. I don't know if I could say I was born different. You know, I don't, if I were raised a particular way, a different way, but I think, you know, even when you look at my uh, life history and you look at some of the research being done about, you know, how early would you have had to have different environmental triggers that would trigger these uh, genetic propensities. And I, when I was an infant, I obviously was not aware of this, right? I have no memory of this, but I'm told that when I was an infant, I had a particularly bad case of colic, which caused me, my parents say, I cried 23 hours a day. And I seemed to be inconsolable, and everybody would try to, you know, she just needs this, she just needs this other thing, but it wouldn't work. So they would just put me in a room, and I would cry myself out. And I ended up having to go to the doctor because I had ruptured my navel due to excessive crying. And eventually I got better, but sometimes I think, is, is something like that, would something like that have been enough to trigger particular genes? You know, obviously when I'm crying that much, I'm probably not getting the same sort of physical affection and loving interaction with my parents or with my siblings or my other relatives that I otherwise would. Mm. Do you smoke? For me to endure that, including the ruptured navel. Ooh. So was this... Was this something that interrupted my development as early as infancy? It's hard to say. Okay. I, I, I don't want to be flippant, but do you smoke? I do not smoke. Okay, because I was just going to say the, the Freudian explanation, of course, would be um, a traumatic event taking place in the, in the oral stage of development and, and therefore not trusting people and so forth. But I don't know. I've never heard of um, a sickness causing uh, this kind of thing, but – it's i'm certainly open to that the uh, a sickness caused it i mean to say that there are particular environmental traumatic events that could possibly trigger certain things mm. and even denial of uh physical affection you know we have the romanian orphans who mm. were in orphanages and all of their physical needs were being met they were being fed they were going to sleep but they still ended up having deep psychological issues and people think it's because they weren't touched enough, held enough when they were babies. Mm -hmm. Which is actually very necessary for for children. Um, okay, so let's fast forward just a few years. When you were a child, now childhood is very awkward for people. Uh, but did did you see that other people had different ways of interacting with each other? Uh, and certain things did not trigger reactions in you? I would say that the thing that seemed most different about my childhood peers was that they were largely unaware of the, the larger machinery of the world. They didn't understand how things worked the same way that I did. I was very interested in adult things. You know, how, how do you get to this place? How do you buy a car? How, why do I have to go to school? These, these broader questions and awareness of how things worked and what were the power hierarchies that were influencing my life. And I felt like my childhood peers, they never were aware of them. They didn't really care about them. They, they just lived their life uh, and were sort of acted upon rather than ever choosing to be the actors 
So I did think that was a, a main difference. They seem to be more, you know, they, people say that sociopaths are self-centered, but to a large extent, <laughs> non-sociopathic children seem more self-centered. They're in their own little world and they're incapable of even comprehending that there's sort of a world beyond what they see. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. The idea that one of the characteristics that's listed is a questioning of authority. And at a very young age, if you're questioning authority, then you want answers at the same time, whereas I don't think most people really have that maybe in-depth ability to question about what's going on. And if you started with that at a very young age, did that lead to you being ostracized by other kids or bullied? I think so. You know, it's interesting in question authority. I think that people think of teenagers as being that's the the age, the developmental age at which people start to really question authority. But and everybody hates teenagers, right? Because they, you know, there's they sort of act like know-it-alls. They make problems for people. They part of questioning authority is to sort of upset these social norms and other people bear the negative externalities of that. You know, when you uh, act out in class and the teacher gets very angry and then says, okay, there's no more recess for anybody, then your classmates might be upset with you. So yeah, I do think that it was hard for me to sort of navigate socially uh, sometimes with the, that particular peer group because they, they never valued the things that I valued at least the most. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you find your, well, that, that of course leads maybe to a feeling of, um, being at a higher level, a higher plane, and a higher calling. But did you, during this time period, when s triggers that would cause other kids maybe to cry or act emotionally, uh, how did that affect you? I don't think that I was bothered by the same things that other children were bothered by. I mean, I obviously, I feel frustration just like everybody else, irritation, uh, I'm sure that I cried when I was hit, if I was hurt about something, but a lot of times it was just easy for me to become very single-mindedly focused on one thing. And if, when I am focused that way, and I'm, I still remain this, this way, when I'm focused this way, it's very easy for me to uh, kind of forget about everything that else that's going on. If I'm so focused, I could be very hurt, for instance, and not really acknowledge it, or not really feel it. And if you're having an emotion that you don't acknowledge, then it's it's basically it's as if you're not having the emotion at all. Mm -hmm. Did you find that you had to sometimes mimic emotion? Like let's pretend like you get in trouble in school, and sometimes kids will start crying to get out of something or to gain attention for, or to gain sympathy from the teacher. Did you find that sometimes you had to do that? I think you know it's interesting that you asked that because I think that. What I I don't think that's such a uh, unique to sociopathic children trait. I think that all children are that way. And if anything, sociopaths just never really value authentic emotions or come to value authentic emotions like everybody else does. You know, I look at I've been interacting with these children recently and they do something wrong and the parent confronts them about it. And the child, you know, what, what would you do if you were the child? You'd make up some excuse. Did you intend? Who hurt your brother? Oh no, I accidentally, you know, knocked him over what, because I wasn't paying attention. Or did you did you mean to steal this? No, I didn't realize that it was somebody else's. They they come up with this sort of excuse or they cry. You know, somebody hits them. They're not really hurt, but they want retribution or they want to get the other person in trouble or they want whatever they want. So they're constantly coming up with these lies and faking emotions to sort of meet more what the parents seem to be expecting. You know, we, we rarely, the way that I've seen parents, they rarely confront the child in a way that incentivizes honesty. You know, that somehow crying is meant to elicit an honest reaction. Cry when you are actually hurt. Uh, you know, admit that you were wrong. Admit that you stole this thing, and that's fine, and we can move on from there. It's almost like children are incentivized to do the exact opposite, to constantly be lying and manipulating. Uh, otherwise, I think they're worried, the child is worried about being seen a particular way. Because if you're the type of person who would steal, you know, you don't want your parents' disappointment. You don't also want the reputational harm that will come from your parents' disappointment. 
and then start looking at you uh, more closely from then on. Well, that's interesting. So you seem to be implying that uh, children from children from authoritarian homes have to learn to be somewhat more deceitful than children that come from uh, homes in which there's a interplay between the parents and the the children and a certain level of respect. Uh, I it would depend on how you define authoritarian, but I would say it's almost the opposite that children. Children in a home where that's very authoritarian to the extent that and defined as uh, parents who enforce rules no matter what, no matter if you intended to hurt your brother or didn't intend, or you knew that you were stealing something or you weren't aware that you were stealing, that no matter what you were sort of thinking or what was going through your mind at that time, that you get the same sort of consequence. Children in those situations have no incentive to make up a fake backstory about how they intended something else, right? Because it leads to the same outcome. They're still going to get the same punishment. Children whose parents try to, are trying to raise good people, you know, and want to encourage and sort of shame them about these moral issues. You know, it's not nice to do this, this thing and then express this sort of uh, moral disappointment and are uh, kind of bring in emotional aspects. I think those children have a huge incentive to lie because they want to avoid judgment. And I think a lot of people, you know, this is something that people as adults continue to do. And this is a little bit of a self illusion. You do something, you intentionally do something, you cut somebody off or you cut in line or you, you underpay somebody or you give them a bad tip. And then afterwards, if you're confronted, you come up with some sort of self justification. Oh, you know, I wasn't paying attention. And so I deserve this, or the service was really poor or, or whatever it is, you you come up with some sort of moral justification after your bad behavior once you're caught. And you learn that as children, I think, because we as a society do care, you know, not sociopaths, but everybody else cares about what is your intention, not just what did you do, what was your action, and what were the consequences of that action, negative or positive, but how did you feel when you were doing that action? Did you want to help somebody? Did you want to hurt somebody? Were you hoping that this would be positive for them? Did, were you hoping that it would be negative for them? Right. And so since since there's such a uh, premium sort of placed on these intentions and we, we can flip our minds, we can think that, okay, spanking a child is right if you're intending to discipline them, but not if you're just angry or not if you enjoy spanking them. But how about this? What if you are intending to discipline them, but you also enjoy spanking children? You know, what is that good or is that bad? You know, there are a lot of uh, gray areas when you get into intention and children learn these sort of moral gray areas and learn to manipulate them starting very young. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that children, though, that they, they start noticing their differences, um, they start learning how to develop these to be able to get their way better? I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, – when we got when we graduate beyond the six and seven and eight year old child, but we start getting into the young teenager that uh, many people fear. Um, at this point, if the child feels like they don't have the same emotional reaction to a situation, how does that impact on the child? Uh, I mean, you know, there's some kids like, for instance, we have someone with Asperger. They have a hard time expressing emotions in a situation, and it's very difficult for them to learn how to interact with people. But I seem to get kind of the opposite uh, impression of people with psychopathy or, or sociopathy, that they learn how to uh, get through the situations much easier once they learn what makes people tick. Yeah, I think that uh, it's an interesting and it's it's so true you know we have we're constantly looking at people's uh, emotional reactions in order to judge their intention that's essentially what we're trying to do right so you have something like in the United States right now the George Zimmerman trial and did he just go out and want to kill somebody and set this whole situation up so he could be a predator and kill somebody and claim afterwards that it was self-defense you know or 
did he, you know, was there another story? He really did think his life was threatened and maybe he acted poorly, but, you know, he, uh, you know, leave his house and kill somebody that night, right? And you look at some of the re reactions that normal people are having and they're saying things like he's not showing enough regret or remorse. And they're looking at his emotions in order to make a, an assessment of his credibility, essentially, and trying to figure out what actually happened that night. And I think that people with Asperger's, you know, they are at a disadvantage because they're not having normal reactions. So people, they think, you know, well, so imagine if George Zimmerman did have Asperger's, right? He wouldn't be having the same sorts of normal reactions and people would be like, well, if I, you know, were in that situation, I wouldn't have done that. But you can't really do that with somebody who has Asperger's. You wouldn't have the same sorts of emotional reactions if you did have Asperger's. So you can't really put yourself in the shoes of somebody with Asperger's or make those sorts of assessments of he's not being emotional enough or he's not showing the right emotions. So I do think that that can be tricky for people who have different uh, emotions than everybody, not everybody, but sort of the, the majority, the dominant and vocal majority. Well, I guess I would get into, I, I suppose if I, was in, if I was in someone's shoes that was being on trial for anything, I personally would, even if I didn't feel remorse for what I had done, I would do my best to sh make it look as if I did to gain the sympathy of the jury. Exactly what I was talking about before. You would you try to come up with the emotional reaction that you think is going to lead people to the right conclusion, whatever you sort of define in your mind as the, the desired conclusion. And that this is sort of what I was talking about with children, is they learn this very young. They realize there's a particular emotional reaction. You should be sad, you know, after you've hit your brother and show a certain amount of remorse. And if you don't show a certain amount of remorse, then it's possible that you're going to get punished and keep getting punished until you do show that certain amount of remorse. Yeah, so so yeah, I mean if you if you don't show any emotions, then mom or dad's gonna be really upset with you if you've done something wrong versus if you're at least pretending to cry. Um I'm gonna veer oh go ahead. I sort of understand uh, why people do that. They it is true that we think that intent matters and that's why there are differences in homicide, right? It's different we think if you walked out the door with a gun and then in cold blood shot somebody down versus if you show up at your house and you find your spouse in bed with somebody else and then you get very angry and you shoot. We sort of think that those are different and for, for good reasons. We think the people who shoot in cold blood, that uh, there, there might be other situations in which they would also shoot in cold blood, whereas it's probably only once that you're going to walk in on your spouse uh, cheating on you, right? Mm -hmm. So bit of a good reason there, but I think that it also, it, it sets up perverse incentives. It sets up definitely some uh, weird incentives about forcing people to lie. And in fact, teenagers who commit crimes, frequently, you know, the uh, teenager who murders a very serious crime, they frequently don't understand the full consequences of their action. They don't really understand what it is to take a life because they're still so early in their own lives that they, they just may not show the same amounts of a sense of gravity of the situation when they're caught, they're arrested. And this is frequently used against them. And they're frequently called, you know, these cold hearted killers because when they got arrested by the cops, they weren't crying. You know, they were even making jokes. They seemed right the whole time. They, they weren't upset at all. And people think, whoa, this person's sick. I can't imagine somebody who could kill somebody and still act so normally afterwards. Mm -hmm. But because people think, some people at least, psychologists think it's because the teenager has no natural sense of the gravity of his actions. But the result, he gets sentenced more harshly. The judge is not sympathetic to him. He gets a, a, a much worse result because he's unable to come up with these signs of remorse that people are expecting to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I've uh, always felt that it's it's interesting when you see people that are going up for parole. They always seem to have found Jesus, and I wonder how many of those people are just doing that because they know the parole board member. Who, uh, there's got to be some of the parole board members that are going to be thinking, "Oh, well, you know, this person, you know, seems repentant now." Well, I think it's so sad that they have to even fake. You know, if I were to uh, advise somebody who was going up for parole, I would probably also say convert to some sort of religion. And then that is going to be the explanation that people are going to find more, most uh, believable 
in terms of why you would possibly change your behavior because maybe they themselves are religious or they have seen other people convert and change their behavior drastically. And it's, it's just not as believable if you just sat down and thought, you know, I'm going to be a different person today. We don't think that that is uh, as strong or compelling a story as if somebody has converted recently to Islam or Mormonism or Christianity or whatever else it is. Okay. Uh, speaking of which, I got to get into this. Uh, your article, you point out that you are Mormon. Yes. Okay. Now, um, the the thing is that a lot of times, uh, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use an analogy from one of my books in which the main character is trying to she's watching a televangelist on TV, and the televangelist is saying that you need to feel guilt for your sins, you need to feel remorse and so forth, and then come to Jesus. Uh, I know that a lot of conservative religions have this idea that. You, you really have to feel bad about something you have done. Um, if you have a personality, I'll say personality, psychopathic. If you have a psychopathic personality, then one of the traits is that you don't feel as much or maybe even any guilt or empathy. So how does that work uh, when maybe someone will get up and give a sermon or a talk saying, um, you need to feel this pain before you can reach these spiritual levels. Right. I think it's Paul that talks about godly sorrow. You have to have godly sorrow for your sin, and godly sorrow is what leads to repentance. Uh, I think that that seems to be generally true. I think generally speaking, most people, um, they... They don't choose to change until they've reached a point where they have this very viscerally emotional reaction against whatever their sin of choice happens to be, right? So let's say gambling. If we think gambling is a sin, or at least over-gambling, you gamble away your kid's diaper money, and you're going to keep doing it until you finally you know, look at your child who's there starving and you know, no diapers, and then you, you feel so sorry what you've done that you finally have a reason to stop doing it right i think that's that's sort of the, the typical story about people who change you know drug abuse intervention people say you have to hit rock bottom and realize uh that you are destroying your life in order for you to uh to get better and i i sort of agree but i also think it's very easy to cognitively understand the negative consequences of your action too. I don't think you necessarily need this visceral emotional reaction to things in order to uh, spur a desire to change. So when we think about the word repent, the word repent itself, the root is that you're, you're turning away from something. And that's exactly what the godly sorrow is meant to do is to turn you away, the act of turning away and turning in a different direction and then maintaining that that good, better direction that you've changed to. But again, I don't think that you need an emotion to be able to make these sorts of changes. You know, businesses frequently will make strategic decisions. They'll change from instead of, you know, doing this, making uh, good A, we're going to start making good B instead. And they don't need any emotional decision or emotional aspects of the of decision to make these sorts of decisions, right? They sometimes they won't do it. Sometimes they'll stay thinking there's a recent article about Dell computers, which talked about how they kept making PCs or maybe it was Intel, thinking that this was going to, you know, PCs were just gonna stick with PCs. And even when there started to be smartphones, they still said, Oh no, we're gonna keep making PCs, right? And these people might get left behind in the market. Just because it's possible to make mistakes cognitively, I think they're also possible to make mistakes emotionally. And the, the net result should be what we're really going for. The net result should be taking information, whether it's emotional information or it's an information that you sort of collected and interpreted uh, cognitively, and assessing where should I, based on this information, uh, what I've been doing and whether this has been working for me, should I make any changes in my life? So a cost-benefit analysis, essentially. Absolutely. Okay, so does it – do when you see people becoming emotional – and I, th this is true for many different religions. Uh, you can switch on the TV and see people crying 
um, when they are talking about religion. Um, and then, of course, I there's other people who, when they speak of religion, it's more of, a, like you said, a cognitive thing in which uh, this is the concept and this is the things that the components to it. And sometimes I see, I don't know, sometimes I, I, I've encountered people who the, the ones that are emotional based don't trust the people who are cognitively based. It's, it's almost like, uh, what was it, Carl Jung, the psychologist, once said the thing that will get a uh, – he didn't use the word fundamentalist, but the quickest way to get a fundamentalist upset is to prove their religion correct using scientific principles. Hmm. So, okay, go ahead. It's interesting you mentioned that. You know, I sometimes feel bad for economists because economists can come up with all sorts of rational or empirical uh, evidence that supports particular theories about the way the world works. And people can still say, yeah, I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter. We still should be, you know, giving these sorts of tax cuts to these people or, or whatever else it is that they're, they're arguing for. People have a, a real uh, – people who are emotional have gut instincts that to them are feel like truth, like with a capital T, truth. And when people reason with them, it's there's only so much uh, changing they can do on their position, I think, because they have these, uh, these deep feelings about things. So I do think it's true. When other people don't seem to have feelings and they approach something that they consider rational uh, or that they consider emotional in a rational way, then they can be very offended. I think a good example is the market for organs, right? So would it be more efficient if people could sell their kidneys, if they're what you could buy and sell kidneys on an open market? Yes, we have lines uh, for years of people waiting for kidneys, and that would definitely solve right away the problem of the shortage of kidneys. But people think that there is something uh, repugnant about that. Emotionally, they can't help but think there's something wrong with uh, people selling something so personal as a body part. Right, so it doesn't matter the economics of it. You can make all the economic arguments you want. You know, this is going to help more people. If they're not going to have to wait, there would be fewer people dying while they're waiting for a kidney. You can make any of those sorts of arguments, but people are still going to find it to be repugnant. Interestingly, people used to think that life insurance was morally repugnant because essentially you're making a bet about when your loved one, your spouse, or whoever else that you're getting a life insurance policy on. Is going to die are they going to die sooner in which you make a lot of money or are they going to die later in which you have premiums and you don't make as much money so you yeah. them to die as quickly as possible essentially and that seems morally repugnant when you put it that way and yet a lot of people would think that it's very socially irresponsible not to have life insurance particularly if you have a spouse or children yeah I I, I think a lot of people if you bring up the scientific arguments and so forth, I, I, I like your analogy with organ uh, transplants, and it reminds me of the guest I had on last week who was, who was a transhumanist. And we were talking about xenotransplantation, and she even felt it was a little bit um, socially, socially bad to raise animals to get their organs so we could transplant those into people. But yet, I mean, we still we raise animals for pork chops, we raise animals for hamburger. Uh, but yet, many people would feel like, well, no, this is wrong, and and I don't see. I mean, emotionally, I can see where they're thinking, you know, poor pig. But the thing is, I mean, there's thousands of pigs killed every day to make sure people have hot dogs and pork chops. Right, and these sorts of moral issues, you know, they're tricky because on the one hand, I acknowledge that they are happy this emotional reaction and that this emotional reaction is as authentic and real to them as anything else could possibly be to them. And so you, you sort of think I have to respect this, you know, as a person, this person has their own autonomy and this, these are their preferences, right? On the other hand, these moral issues, they're so, uh, they're not capital T truth, right? Because from culture to culture, you're going to have differences and what is considered morally wrong or completely fine. And so it can't possibly be that it's wrong to sell your kidney when we have other cultures out there that think that not only is it right, 
this is the best thing to do is to everybody start selling your kidneys so we can stop having people dying on dialysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like I said, even with the issues like, um, well, applying science to people, there's uh, there's the idea that um, I've, I've discussed this before on the show, the, the idea that uh, there's people that they can't have children, so they purchase an embryo, and then they carry the embryo in their womb and then have the baby that way, and people think, well, that, that – some people have this emotional reaction to it when in reality, I mean it's kind of like they've – if you think of it, they all they've done is adopt a child just a lot younger than most people do, but there's like this emotional – uh, framework we have of this is how babies are made and this is how you know and all this kind of stuff right now taking it a little bit further there um let's say you're in a position let's let's pretend instead of a lawyer you were a marketer and you're trying to sell a concept like selling organs um would it be an advantage to you then, even though you might not recognize that level of emotions that these people are having, saying that um, I can't I can't support selling kidneys and livers and stuff from my uncle or my husband or whatever, um, but you'd still be able to use emotion in maybe a public advertising campaign, couldn't you? You'd be able to to know what triggers to touch upon to get people to buy whatever you're trying to convince them um yeah i know it would depend it would depend if i have observed this particular behavior and sort of cataloged it and studied it in general that i would be better at it than the normal person no because the normal person could think to themselves how would i feel about the market for kidneys and think oh bad and that's what most people think. And what, what arguments would I find most persuasive that the market for kidneys is good? And then think, you know, just be able to put your own self through these situations and project essentially your own beliefs on everybody else. And I think that for the majority, the average normal neurotypical person, that that's possible to do. Me as a sociopath, could I do, could I say, you know, what, what is offensive to me about selling kidneys? My answer would be nothing. There's nothing I find offensive. So this has frequently happened in my life where I don't necessarily think that anything's bad, and I haven't encountered a particularly, uh, you know, politically charged situation that looks just like this before. And so I stupidly assert, you know, a position, and then am judged for it because I've got I've given the wrong answer. You know, my moral judgment is being now challenged because. I haven't said uh, what most people happen to believe is morally uh, correct in those situations. So I don't know if I would necessarily have an advantage. I think maybe what you're asking is, is there an advantage in sort of knowing that people have emotional reactions to things that aren't necessarily rational or based in logic? I think that there are, but there would have to be instances of arbitrage. Is there some way where you there's a gap in people's expectations of what the world should look like and what the world actually is, that you can find a way to profit from that gap. Either they, let's say they're, they're very positive, they think that the, the stock market's going up, real estate's going up, and so, and that you don't think that's reality, right? So what would you do? You'd sell them stocks, you'd sell them real estate, you would you know, maybe become a realtor to uh, capitalize off of this, or let's say vice versa, they, they think negatively, you know, the, we'll never get out of this recession, the global economy is terrible, and you think that it's, it's actually going to go up, then you would buy their stocks, you would buy their property. So this understanding of people's emotions, it's more, um, it's usually only helpful when there's a gap. And it's only helpful when you, the sociopath, have recognized that there is a gap. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't understand that people really, really care about whether other people are buying embryos or not. You think, why would they care? But it turns out people care very deeply about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Now, taking that to the next step, <laughs> um, do you think that uh, psychopathy uh, is an advantage when it comes to attaining corporate and political uh, success? It's an interesting question. I don't know if... I, 
I would say definitely, yes, it, there is an advantage to being a sociopath because there aren't that many sociopaths. So the fact that there are only one to four percent of the population is a sociopath, you're going to have particular skills that are going to give you a competitive advantage. And people aren't aware of sociopaths, really. So they're not really going to be planning uh, or defending against you. So I use this example in the book about birds on New Zealand. Before man came to New Zealand, it was just an And there were birds for every uh, part of the ecosystem. There were birds that were so large they could carry a small man off, you know, huge birds with a wingspan of, you know, 10 feet. And then there were very small birds that would, you know, eat the bugs on the ground, right? And these birds, they, in their ecosystem, they came up with defense mechanisms to defend against other birds. So if you were one of these birds on the ground eating the bugs, then a very good defense mechanism for you was to stand perfectly still when there was a predator up ahead because they're flying so high, they're trying to detect movement. And if you stay very still, they won't detect your movement. They won't see you, they won't kill you, right? So that's a very effective defense mechanism against other birds, predator birds. The problem is when man comes and introduces the rat, and then is that a, def a proper defense mechanism for you to, as a small bird, stand very still while a rat comes up and kills you? No, it's a terrible defense mechanism. Similarly, there's going to be a competitive advantage to being a sociopath because most people have their guard up for other people that are just like them. So they come up with these, you know, whatever it is, the equivalent of standing very still. That's the defense mechanism they come up with. But it doesn't work on the sociopath. The sociopath sees things slightly different, has a slightly different perspective. So it's not going to work as well. So there's that competitive advantage. I think there are also traits about a sociopath that, at least in a capitalistic society, are just going to be advantageous. Or, you know, evolutionarily speaking, are going to be, uh, for the most part, advantageous. They seem to take risks, right, more than people. They're, they're a little bit more fearless. So you even just take these two traits. They're going to be the types who, you know, with risk comes reward. That's what they teach in business school. So they're going to be the types to take more risks, be the entrepreneurs, and possibly become the billionaires, right? A lot of people think that Steve Jobs might be a sociopath or at least has several traits of a sociopath. And it, it's not hard to see how this ruthless fearlessness, uh, you, you, you're not hurt by competition. Your feelings aren't hurt by somebody, you know, talking down to you or somebody trying to compete very aggressively with you. In fact, you you like to play with people. You like to fight. You know, you like the, the gamesmanship of it all. So obviously these people are going to have an advantage in a capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. So a person that was going to – I mean the idea of running for a political office at any level scares, I would say, 99 percent of the American public. They would be terrified to even get up in front of people. But yet it seems that someone who's psychopathic might actually enjoy that aspect. They might it might give them a thrill. Right. Yeah. And I don't think there's necessarily anything bad with people being different. I think that a society's strength comes from not having everybody be exactly the same and getting along perfectly. You know, those sorts of the societies are very stagnant and they're ended they're going to end up dying off themselves. Or they're going to end up not doing very well if there's any sort of war or competition with another society. The, the strength in a society is having a lot of variety, a lot of diversity. And if the society is able to take advantage of this diversity, like I think capitalism sort of naturally does. You know, if you have a better idea, we'll know that your idea was better because you're going to be the one making the money, right? Mm -hmm. That being able to integrate the skills of a sociopath, especially the positive skills into a society can, can do wonders for a society, can give it a competitive edge. And that's probably why there are the exact percentage of sociopaths in any given society that there are. One to four percent gives you an edge. And if you had 20 percent sociopaths, it'd be too much. It'd be too much heartlessness. It'd be too much ruthlessness. People wouldn't be able to sleep at night. They'd be sleeping with their gun in their hand, maybe locking doors. There would be too much uh, effort put into you know protecting yourself from uh, people who are trying to take advantage perhaps. Yeah, so that gives it kind of – I've, I've often wondered if you could explain these. Uh, a lot of people call these personality disorders, but if you look at it from an evolutionary psychology point of view, just – yeah, that gives it a framework where, however someone feels about evolution. For, but from an evolutionary psychology framework, 
every personality trait has enabled your ancestors, those ancestors you had with the trait, to survive and thrive, whereas other people became extinct. So therefore, I would say, you know, I mean, the psychopath who's willing to take the chance, maybe the maybe the people that led the Vikings on their trade routes, or maybe the people that set out to the new world were more likely to have these traits. Right, or are making your iPhone, which is not to say that sociopathic traits are all great. You know, it, it's a disorder for a reason. And even I admit that there is something very disordered about it. Uh, these traits, everything in life is a trade-off. Again, a very economic principle. It's not like you can just have one person or one personality type that's going to be perfect in every situation. You look at the animal kingdom and it's not that way. You know, everybody is going to, every animal is going to eventually fall to something, whether it's their own people or uh, another predator or humans or overpopulation or whatever it is. There are bad traits about a sociopath. Sociopaths have a hard time maintaining relationships. They have emotions, but to the extent that they don't necessarily, you know, I don't really give my emotions that much context or meaning. And you think about what makes life worth living. For a lot of people, it's their emotions. And it's that they have emotions and relationships that are very meaningful to them. And so what, what would keep a sociopath uh, sort of happy and keep going on and thinking that life is worth living? You know, it's when you take away those emotions and uh, relationships, it's it's largely winning and success and, and playing games and engaging your intellectual faculties. And is that as uh, rewarding a life as it would be if you had emotions and meaningful relationships? You know, I, I sort of don't think so. I think you have to. I, I think most people would agree that it would be they would rather choose to have meaningful relationships love rather than worldly success. Of course, there are people who, who don't think that way. And there are some famous examples in literature of people who make these sort of devil's bargains to, for success. But for the most part, people aren't really, uh, I don't think people are jealous of sociopaths. They're, they're sometimes jealous that a sociopath can get up and talk and be very comfortable or can be very confident or can be very charming or they're not f afraid of things. And people think, wouldn't it be great if I could just do whatever I wanted, just like a sociopath? But it's not necessarily true that sociopaths can do whatever they want. You know, they have they have limitations. They're just different limitations from yours. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that relate to in such things as interpersonal relationships? I mean, um, is it is it a I mean, is it a love that people have for one another? Or their children, or first-degree relatives, in that sense, or, or is it a um, a sense of loyalty combined with a sense of getting something out of the relationship? Uh, because you have a section of your of your site that talks about sociopathic love, and I think a lot of people who've Maybe only watched a documentary here or there, or seen a you know a TV talk show, would think that's a contradictory term. Do you think it's a contradictory term? I don't think it is a contradictory term, and honestly, I don't know where people are getting this from. Where does it say anywhere in any of the diagnostic criterion? Cleckley, Hare, the DSM. Where does it say that sociopaths can't love? And yet people seem so certain that that's true. You know, I think it is is a little bit of emotional snobbery. I think it's a little bit of, I love this particular way, and this is what I'm going to define as love, and your other types of love sort of don't exist, or I don't think they're as legitimate as my types of love. And I think that's a little bit absurd, because even our idea of love has sort of changed over the years, culturally, right? You know, people used to marry not for love, but you would have maybe a certain sort of love and respect for your spouse, even if it was an arranged marriage, but then maybe you felt passionate about somebody else. And now we sort of think that love is this idea of passion and respect and kind of everything. And I don't know, people search for that sort of love all the time. I don't know how many people are actually finding it. I don't think it's as common and uh, next uh, to have all those traits in, uh, in a romantic relationship as some people sort of like to believe. So for the sociopaths, it's, and with any complex relationship, uh, complex emotion, I should say, like love, 
they're going to be other small emotions that form a part of it, right? So for me, I sort of feel love to me, for the most part, feels like maybe 60 to 70% gratitude, you know, and maybe it's 10% adoration or an admiration for the person. And if it's a romantic love, maybe it's, there's going to be an element of infatuation, maybe even obsession or or person uh, for, because they, uh, they make me look better or they make me feel good. You know, whatever it is that you're sort of factoring into why you have these feelings for this person. I was reading uh, Jim Fallon, who is a neuroscientist and is coming out with a book. He was writing about what, what does love feel like to him? And he says that a lot of admiration and the love he feels for his children, he likes to interact with them on an intellectual level and he admires the people that they've become. And that's feels like to him and it's not necessarily the same sort of selfless uh unselfish uh love that other people might experience but it is something you know and it's it is its own uh reason for being loyal and it's possible for a sociopath to choose to put another person at least above everyone else in the world Mm -hmm. So, in other words, they can be extremely loyal husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, um, but maybe without that, maybe what the maybe the element that a lot of people don't understand is the lack of empathy. Right. And I I don't know if you agree with me here, and if you if you disagree, please let me know. That it's feeling sympathy and feeling empathy are two different things. Uh, if someone comes to me and, and they're overweight and they're telling me they just suffered their, suffered their second heart attack, um, it might be hard for me to feel a sense of, um, of uh, empathy because I'd feel like, well, what are you doing to help your health versus sympathy? I could still feel like, well, I'm glad you're alive. I mean, that must have been a terrible thing to happen. But do, do you feel it's, it's – is that a fair uh, division there? I think that there is a difference. I that I don't know if that that is the distinction I would use necessarily. Uh, maybe you disagree with this definition, but Professor Fallon sort of defines sympathy as the ability to imagine oneself in that particular situation, and you can maybe even uh, you know feel like oh I remember a time when I had that. Uh, hard health situation and that that was really bad you know I feel bad I felt bad during that time so I understand you must also be feeling bad you badly so I think that's kind of how he defines sympathy and empathy he said seems to be and he's a neuroscientist so he thinks it's more like a mirror neuron related where the same way that when you watch somebody you watch somebody swing a golf club for instance and then you're able to it, even if you've never swung a golf club before, you're able to get up to the tee and do some replication, rough replication of what it looks like to swing a golf club. Because your neurons, when you're watching it happen, imagined it was as if your brain was swinging the golf club itself, right? So the idea of empathy, I think, to the extent that there is a difference and that there is such thing as empathy, which I'm not entirely sure of, and I don't think that there is any really conclusive scientific evidence that shows this is definitely empathy and this is definitely what's happening when we empathize with people. But you watch somebody be emotional and your mirror neurons are creating that brain. You're, you're experiencing that emotion at the same time that they're experiencing it. Is that what you think of as the distinction between empathy and sympathy? Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess if I feel like if someone cuts their foot, and I can I can remember what it was like to cut my own foot, and I know what they must be feeling. Well, that's that's more of a sympathy. I wish they hadn't cut their foot, but empathy could be um, putting yourself into the emotional context of that person, and uh, maybe even f well feeling the same kinds of trauma. Now I have read that. Uh, psychopaths are more represented in fields like emergency room doctors which I thought was kind of interesting I mean it, it, it's almost I could almost think that maybe it's better to have a doctor who yeah they know what you're going through but they're not sitting there getting emotionally wrapped up into it right and I think of sometimes I think of I think of these stage moms right 
who their their six year old is playing Annie in this production stage production of the musical, and they're sitting uh, standing on, on the wings stage, but not visible, you know, going through the motions and mouthing the words themselves as if they were out there doing it. When I think of empathy, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's all that valuable. Is that what you really want people doing? Is it rather than focusing on you in that moment, they're feeling their own feelings about what you're going through? I mean, maybe people think that it's great, but I sort of think it's a little bit presumptuous, you know, and it's a little bit self... <laughs> It's a little bit focused on the self, actually, to, for you to be having your own uh, moment while they're undergoing something so extreme. So, I mean, you use a very interesting practical example of obviously, you know, you have this huge uh, uh, pipe sticking out of your leg. You don't want a doctor or a nurse who's thinking, oh, you know, I feel that this exact pain because they're going to be very distracted, right? You want somebody who can, can, as you say, sympathize. They can think, you know, I see... I can see how that would be painful, and so let's figure out a way to make this as uh, painless as possible, and let's get this lead pipe out because you know the practical consequences of walking around with a pipe aren't aren't great. You know, it's it's very easy to come up with these sort of cognitive explanations that I think are more efficient or end up with a, a better result in the long run. Yeah, I... to somebody else's emotional world and uh, sort of let empathy be your guide. Yeah, good point. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, we only have a, about a minute and a half left. Uh, what's the name of your book? And tell us why we should uh, why should people should check out your book. Book is uh, Confessions of a Sociopath: The Life Spent Hiding in Plain Sight. And the book is going to appeal to people who want to who are interested in different types of people, different types of personality, different types of disorder. If you want to see the world, what it looks like through a sociopath's eyes, I take you through the major autobiographical events of my life. I also give my opinions about certain philosophical issues. I give a little bit of advice about sociopaths, particularly sociopathic children. Uh, talk a little bit about what policies might help uh, sociopaths be integrated more fully into society. I talk about the history of the research into sociopathy and the distinctions that people sometimes make based on the terminology or uh, some of the research that's focused more on genetics versus brain scans versus looking at behaviors and why we come up with different results. I think the goal of the book was to start a conversation. I think it's a really interesting topic. Statistically, everybody has met a sociopath, but most people have probably not realized that they met a sociopath. Okay. And there are that sociopaths can really affect your life. Excellent. So that's Confessions of a Sociopath. Well, Emmy, well, thank you very much for sharing all of this really valuable information with us tonight. Thank you. Okay. Take care.